Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Um, so um, we are going to talk about OpenStack consumption models, and we came up with a catchy phrase, um, uh, good, bad, and the ugly. So no, no labels, no judgment. But you, thank you, you all like for it, coming. Right? Um, so good I'm going plan. to be moderating this panel today. I figured it's easier to walk around. So if you have any questions, I can be the mic runner as well. Uh, my name is Ashish Nadkarni. I'm an analyst with IDC. I've been covering OpenStack for over four years now. Um, so I've sort of started at the Atlanta summit, and this is my si uh, sixth summit, I think. Um, so, um, so anyway, um, thank you again. Um, either grab something to eat, or this is standing between you and lunch. Hopefully, um, we'll keep this interesting enough so if, when you go to lunch, it'll be worth the wait. Um, all right, so with that, let me introduce, we have a fascinating panel of folks today. Um, so let me introduce them. Um, do you want to go through and introduce yourselves? Sure. Uh, my name is VS, VS Joshi. I am from this company, Dell EMC. I'm in the emerging technologies team at the Dell EMC. And uh, prior to Dell EMC, I had my own startup. And uh, yes, I have had experience with the public cloud and things like that. But currently, I'm with Dell EMC. And uh, I'll be talking about uh, OpenStack consumption models. Great, thank you. I'm not James Page, as per the, the, uh, the description. I'm Mark Baker. Uh, James was unable to make it, sadly. So um, I'm the OpenStack product manager at Canonical, also branded. You'll see uh, three of us branded. <laughs> um, so uh, and I also sit on the OpenStack board. So I'm uh, our representative on the on the board, and I sit on the product working group and a couple of other things too. So very good. Uh, hi everyone, Kamesh Pemaraju with Marantis, branded as well. <laughs> We're all branded. Um, so long time in the community, about six years. This is my tenth consecutive summit. Um, and been with Marantis for about two years. I run marketing and technology alliances there. And prior to that, I was with Dell. So very familiar with all the Dell OpenStack solutions prior to that as well. Okay. Thank you, guys. Um, and I'm your unbranded moderator. Uh, so, um, so I'm going to make this interactive. So questions anytime during the panel are welcome. I'm, I have some questions here uh, just to get the conversation started. I'd like to keep this conversational. So uh, if you feel that you need to ask a question, don't wait till the end. You know, let's uh, let's have a conversation. The folks at the back, if you guys want to move up in the front, I think the room is a little too big for us, but move up if you want. All right. So um, yes, as the okay. as Dell EMC being the newest kid on the block, if they say that, uh, or if you're allowed to say that, um, why don't you sort of kick this off by giving us a lay of the land as how you saw it or how EMC saw it as it walked into this field. Uh, okay. Open stack. Okay. So I mean. Uh... So first of all, we are talking about the private uh, consumption models or the private cloud consumption models as far as OpenStack is concerned. Now, at a very high level, uh, the way to look at it is that there are a couple of models. One, the most hands-off model is that of a managed cloud service provider. That's the most hands-off approach, yeah? And in that hands-off approach, there is somebody else that is creating the cloud, that is somebody else managing the cloud, supporting the cloud. And you, as consumers, you essentially have just what can be called as a domain operator at your end that is managing the creating the users, creating the quotas, and managing the cost, and the relationship between the cloud service provider and your employees and things like that. So that is the most hands-off approach, managed cloud. We would like to say that immediately after that is the turnkey system model or the appliance model. And in the appliance model, essentially, yes, you do have the domain operator. And you also have a very low-skilled cloud operators. Yeah? And then I would say the third model would be the distribution model, the distro model uh, from Red Hat and from Canonical. Uh, again, let them speak about it. But I think that there is where you might need, in addition to having the domain operator, the cloud operator, you also need a cloud architect. And the final is the do-it-yourself model, where essentially you, you need the whole thing, plus you also need the engineering support and uh, those kind of things. So you need, again, all these functions that I talk about, like domain operator, cloud operator, cloud architect, and the engineering support, all these things can be done by one person also. But again, I just want to put them in these various buckets or so. So I think that I would say, at a very high level, just to get the discussion started, I would say those are the four models. And, Oh. I'd, I'd, I'd add a fifth, actually, of course, which is public cloud. So it's very, in, indeed, you know, for early OpenStack and still today, a great deal of people consuming OpenStack services uh, through public clouds, whether it's Rackspace, OVH, or, or whoever. So it's not obviously an on-premises yeah, yeah, option, yeah, yeah, but yeah. It's, okay. it's another model of consumption. I, mean, uh, I was just talking about the private cloud model. And yes, absolutely, yes. So why should anyone even bother about consuming anything 
other than the public cloud. You know, I mean, I mean I'm being controversial in the sense that I believe that uh, the the software. So our our CMO Boris Rensky has has been has famously said about a month ago he wrote a blog saying that infrastructure software is dead. Um, nobody wants to consume software at at large scale anymore. It's it's the the model that uh, VS was talking about. At the end of the day, you want the Amazon like experience, whether it is private, public, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it's the user that that's having that experience. It needs to be seamless. Um, so. We can talk more about it, but I want to start with that kind of a that, starting point. I think that that's really a, a challenge of operations, though. So it's not that you don't want to consume software. You, you want to absolutely use software. It's just that operating large, complex technical projects like OpenStack can be complex. Whilst the cost of acquisition, because it's open source software, can be very low, the cost of operations can be, can be high. And it's that that people are looking to try and the, remove that cost, or at least minimize that cost. Yeah, that's an excellent segue into our, um, so thank you for the introduction, folks. Um, the, it's a great segue into our next uh, sort of question uh, is into the types of customers that would be naturally um, you know, uh, inclined to go with one or the other. And so in your experience, uh, what kinds of customers um, come to you or, or you are able to you know, um, sort of appeal to them, your, your solution? So Kamesh, if you want so to So some very there. large um, OpenStack users you know, with I'd say more than 5,000 nodes. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have done cost models. We have done cost models for DIY, for distributions, and for managed services. Uh, and you know, some of the largest telcos in the world started off with DIY mm -hmm. because they, they find you know, that at their scale, with hundreds of data centers and tens of thousands of nodes, having an in-house team with the expertise and, and, and all the you know, source code access and all that stuff actually works for them. Over time, though, um, what ended up happening, I'll give you an example. I, I can't name customers, but one of our customers ended up what we fondly call Frankenstein clouds. So they ended up doing, you know, they had 100 data centers, and every data center had a different cloud. One was running Liberty, another one was running Kilo, another one was running something else, and all the versions were all over the place, and they ran into this maintenance uh, nightmare, if you will, right? So at, then they said, look, you know, we're spending way too much time on maintaining these different clouds. How do we get this out of this Frankenstein cloud mode and kind of have a standardized you know, software that's kind of distributed and, and working everywhere? So large customers start out that way. They're thinking they can do it. But ultimately, they need standards and standard software that can be deployed across the board. So that's one example I just wanted to throw this, out. This, I think, I mean, it follows most many technologies. Many technologies follow the same path, right, where at the beginning of that, that project, um, it, the early adopters are doing a lot of the heavy lifting, the engineering themselves, creating very bespoke environments. And then it goes through a very typical life cycle over time uh, where it becomes more productized. The uh, kind of early majority start coming into and companies, distributions, ourselves and others come in and start to productize that all the way through to full kind of utility commodity. And OpenStack is on the same journey. Linux follows the same journey. Mm -hmm. Database technologies follow, follow the same journey. And, and, and OpenStack is on the same journey, too. So a lot of the super users, and, and we love them, Walmart, at and and all these kind of people uh, that are using OpenStack today, they were the, the people that were, were taking the arrows. It's the people yeah. further down, yeah. the, down the line that, that get the corn, as it yeah, were. So. I think this is, like, this is very, very fascinating. It's fascinating to see the age-old technology adoption life cycle of innovators, the mm -hmm. early majority, er, the early adopters, early majority, late majority, and laggards. And we are at that stage. OpenStack mm -hmm. is six years old. And yes, we have come to that, uh, the, as Jeffrey Moore calls it, the chasm, right? And we are at that stage of crossing the chasm as such. Mm -hmm. And this is where I feel that, uh, uh, yes, the people who are enthusiasts, technology enthusiasts and things like that, yes, they have tried these things, they have taken the arrows and things like that, they have learned from their experiences and things like that. And now it is for companies like ours, maybe IBM, HP, Dell, to essentially take this technology and make it more adaptable for the masses, for the early majority and the late majority as such. And I think we are a very interesting phase of this whole OpenStack journey. And at six years old, I do feel that, yes, we are at that whole, uh, the chasm thing right now. The tipping point. point yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. So I'd like to ask a question of the audience. How many people have OpenStack today deployed? And how many of you have it in production? Wow. So good. Okay. Uh, yeah. and, and so I think uh, 
for the folks who don't have OpenStack, I think the, what, what would be the um, one thing that you would want to tell them that they are here at the summit? You know, what would they be uh, interested in knowing from you as a, as, as a sort of provider of an OpenStack solution? Okay. You know, Mark, do you want to go first? Sure, sure. So, um, Having been involved in OpenStack since, since day one, uh, we recognize that there is no one size fits all. So uh, whilst we produce a, an OpenStack distribution, extremely popular distribution, um, that is, uh, it's not necessarily the fit for everybody. So we have worked with both public cloud providers to build that public cloud infrastructure based on OpenStack that end, end users can consume. We also have a fully managed service, for example, called Bootstack, build, operate, transfer stack, we've had for a couple of years. Um, and that is a model where we will manage the cloud, but then hand the cloud over, basically give the keys to the car, as it were, to the users once they're, uh, uh, they're good. And that was initially launched, actually, for, to overcome the skills gap problem, right? This was one of the issues. Um, you know, I guess everybody that's running OpenStack here is probably be hiring. Um, and the, uh, it's overcome that skills gap. We can build, stand the cloud up, we can manage it, we get it running, but when the, the, the users feel comfortable to take it over themselves, they can do that. Um, uh, and we have customers that operate across all of that spectrum, including some very large customers doing you know, several thousand nodes that we are managing you know, to, a, to an agreed SLA. So um, we see you know, across the broad spectrum. Yes. So, coming? so the question is, what would you want folks in oh, the Okay, so for all the people, you know, I think uh, if in case you get a chance, uh, see the video recording of yesterday's session. There was a session called Broken Stack. And it was in the evening, and it was to, uh, they were talking about uh, people who have started to implement OpenStack, and they took three use cases and how they failed in that particular thing. And again, they were just trying to uh, impart the lessons that they have learned. So if in case you get a chance, do see that open, uh, that broken stack uh, session from yesterday. Today morning, there was a session, and in that session, the person clearly articulated what was the difference of going for Amazon Cloud versus private OpenStack Cloud, and the cost differences. They have done the entire... They took a configuration for a particular configuration. If they would go with AWS, what would be the cost? And if they would go with uh, private OpenStack Cloud, what would be the cost? And the, I mean, I was surprised to see the difference in numbers. OpenStack private cloud was literally one fourth the cost of uh, AWS. So again, yes, OpenStack, uh, definitely go for OpenStack. But at the same time, remember, there are a lot of people who have had these experiences. So I strongly believe that, yes, taking uh, advantage of uh, players like Mirantis and Canonical and Dell is absolutely essential, I would say, for, again, if you, if you are looking for a tremendous amount of customization and things like that, and that is the core of your operation, that is the core of your business, then I do understand the do-it-yourself approach. But if that is not the case, I would say that, you know, taking advantage of these vendors who are essentially adding that extra muscle and you know you don't have to do it by yourself. If, yeah, that's yeah. what I would say. That's yeah. a great point. And Kamish, what, what would you tell your prospects? So the biggest problem with OpenStack is not deployment anymore. So that problem is solved. Uh, in, initially, it was all about, oh, it's very complex. I can't get it up and running. Building is not an issue anymore. The problem is operations, as he pointed out earlier. How do you operate? So what, am, what do I mean by operations? Things like upgrades, updates, you know, getting your patches done, your security, standard stuff that you guys are used to in a VMware environment or a Microsoft environment, and there's tooling available for that. Now, in OpenStack, it's not quite there. How do you, how do you monitor all of your apps? How do you monitor infrastructure? There are tools out there, but you can't really get a holistic operations environment running. So if you're running a 1,000-node cloud, guess what's going to happen? Every day, every second, something's going down. Right? So how do you manage that? That's the operations piece that I think the community is starting to address now. Uh, but that's, that's a challenge you have to keep in mind as you go and start building larger and larger clouds with OpenStack. So we st we're starting to help that with managed services. So for companies that don't know how to do that, we call it LCM, or lifecycle management. So upgrade from one version to another version is an example of that. Uh, things are going down all the time. How do you mo monitor those things? How do you bring things up? At the end of the day, as an infrastructure operator for your cloud, you have to provide a certain SLA to your end users. So one of the biggest failures that we see with many of our customers is what we call the, um, we call it the orphan cloud syndrome. Orphan cloud. So these, you know, they start off very enthusiastically. They come to us, we build a cloud, it's maybe 50 nodes. We start off with that, great. And then after six months, they come back and say, oh, we don't have any tenants. Nobody's coming on board. 
what's going on? And then it turns out there's an SLA issue, developers try to use it, it doesn't work. So that problem has to be solved. You know? And it's not just a technology problem, it's also a cultural process problem. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Um, so while we're talking about the readiness, the, uh, the operations challenges, um, I'd like to ask a question of you uh, folks who have had OpenStack deployed, who wants to offer to uh, list out some of the challenges that you've had. Anyone? I'll run the mic for you. <laughs> you have to raise your hand. Oh, you oh there you are. Okay. Hi, thank you for, for sharing your thoughts. Um, on, on my reading, uh, the main challenge as, as, as of today for somebody that is uh, approaching OpenStack for the first time is to decide between uh, the distros or going vanilla. Uh, and by choosing a distro, once you have your workload running and, and going, despite of the, the keynote that we have with the inter, interoperability, uh, it, it's, it's like a marriage. Uh, meaning uh, you're going to have to revamp your entire network, some of the services you are, you are able to move, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's like a marriage. You have to make sure that you're choosing the right partner. And I say that by, 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 by experience. I won't name callers, rats, or, uh, and we are moving away from one distro uh, because of many issues, and this is a very tough thing to do. Thank you. That's a that's fast, great insight. And and if you don't mind, uh, what kind of uh, business are, is your firm in? Uh, I work for a big telco in Brazil. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you. So I'd like to throw back the question to the panel. How do you address this challenge with distro? How, is is that a concern? Is that a question? So I, it's certainly one of the big concerns we see with with uh, users. Um, is, is around lock-in, right? They want to ensure that they're choosing a technology that is going to, or a partner that's going to give them options in the future that they're not going to feel that they are locked into. Um, standardization, the interop demo, for example, uh, is, is one way to be able to do that. But being able to take a workload and drop that into any cloud, uh, any OpenStack cloud, I should say, irrespective of the distribution, is it's, it's more than just a set of common templates, right? There's all sorts of commercial things that need to be in place and support agreements and things like that. Um, to some degree, um, you know, as, as Adrian Cockcroft at AWS asked, I think, at, at one of the OpenStack Silicon Valley, um, who wants to avoid lock-in? Everyone puts their hand up. Uh, um, uh, who's married, right? And, uh, and, and it, so everybody is, is, is prepared to accept a degree of lock-in in, in their, uh, their environment, it's just where that dial lies and, and the amount that you're prepared to kind of stay. So clearly differences lie between distributions. We want to be able to differentiate, you're good at X, we're good at Y, you're, you're good at Z. But so, it, can the customer, let's say for example, the customer goes with one particular distro, uh, I mean, I will counter that lock-in argument by saying that yes, they can move to the other distro. They can move to the other vendor for support. Is that, is that a very easy transfer to make or no? Not really. Uh, as, as he was pointing out, all these distros are different. Mm -hmm. Underlying distros are different. The way they are tested, the, the, the way they are packaged, the way they are deployed. Marantis has, our, uh, has a tool called Fuel. You know, Red Hat has their own and Canonical has their own. They mm -hmm. use Juju. We use something else. Mm -hmm. So once you are in that stack, right, you're pretty much locked in. Let's face it. I mean, there's no two ways around it. Now, can your workloads run on top? Sure. I mean, that's what the interoperability is all mm -hmm. about. I mean, as long as you're keeping your APIs, you know, OpenStack API standard, and that's what you're using. In theory, your workload should be able to, you should be able to migrate them. But if you want to change the distro, believe me, that's going to be a tough one. And be supported. That's and be supported. I mean, that's yeah. the whole point of a distro, right? You're getting a distro because you want support from a vendor. And if you, if you want to switch, then you're, you're, you're basically locked in. Now, that being said, uh, at Marantis, we have been very, very focused on being agnostic and as open source as possible. Like all of, every other vendor is, of course, also open source. But we have um, branded ourselves as what we call pure play, meaning we're as close to the trunk as possible and, and all that. And, and we keep an open ecosystem of partners that we can integrate with, et cetera. So that being said, if you're using Fuel, then you're pretty much locked into Fuel. Uh, so how you deploy, how you configure, uh, what networking you use underneath, all those things are tying you down, right? So, but once you make those choices, you're locked in. 
our value proposition is you have a vast array of choices you, you can make with Mirantis. I think I, it's understanding yeah. Yeah. the degree of lock-in. So understanding you're making a conscious decision, I'm going to go with this vendor or this vendor or this vendor, and I understand this will be the cost of exit if I, if I want to change. So it's just knowing that, right? It doesn't mean you have to completely avoid it, because there's all sorts of other issues like support, as you say, you're dealing with. But recognizing that they exist. Just being open source is not the kind of get out of jail free card. Uh, that that many pe many people may think it is, you know. So just understand the risks. Now, unless you're doing your DIY throughout, right? And then yep. you can go just trunk and do everything yourself. But again, that has its its cons as well, right? When it breaks, it's very hard. It's very hard. When it to breaks, do. you get to yeah. keep all the pieces. Yeah. So yes, yeah. Dell has taken a rather unique or sort of a different approach in this situation. Would you want to talk about the pros and cons of, you know, delivering it as a packaged, fully packaged appliances in this case? sort of not worrying about the distro, if you will, or is, is there a challenge to be uh, addressed there? Okay, so again, considering the fact that Dell and EMC, legacy EMC, we ad address the <coughs> enterprise marketplace as such, right? We are trying to take the technology and trying to make it consumable by a massive amount of customers, by make it widely adoptable and widely used by lots of uh, enterprise as such, yeah? So because of that, I, I do feel that, yes, uh, when you go, I mean, as compared to a uh, distro, again, in a distro also, and please correct me, Kamish, and yourself, mm. uh, I do feel that, yes, there is a role for a cloud architect to play in a distro where the person has to decide which hardware, which software, what cloud configuration, what kind of service am I going to provide to my consumers, the storage, whether it is network, whether it is compute, or database as a service. So those are the decisions that the customer has to take in case of a distro. Whereas in an appliance model, we don't, we have kind of limited those choices. We are saying, okay, we have a certain point of view. We have gone through all these things, and we have put this hardware and this software and this networking and this. Uh, we have put all these things together, and now you focus only on the applications part of it. And that is where I would like to uh, differ from a distro as such. Yeah, but otherwise, again, I do feel more than we competing with each other, we fall in the same bracket as opposed to DIY versus a public cloud, I would say. So yeah. the downside of it, so we have done, we had done HAD, because we, we have stopped doing appliances. We had an appliance program at Marantis too. What we found, and again, I don't know, VS, maybe your, your experience is different. What we found is um, many of our customers, we go with an appliance, we say, here it is, all pre-configured, ready to go, plug it in, and you're ready to go with your workloads. And invariably, I'd say 99.95% of the time, they'll come back and say, I want to change that. I want this networking, I, I have some other server there, this storage use case, that, or this, or that. Or, and then all of a sudden, you're no longer in the, in the box. <laughs> now, now you're doing architecture. You're saying, okay, you want this, let's start with this appliance, we're gonna change this, this, and this. And I want it in 10 different data centers with this much scale, then all of a sudden you're back to the distro. <laughs> So what we, what we found, it, it, this is our experience in Marantis, is that wasn't very, it wasn't flying for us. Mm -hmm. Nobody was buying appliances. At the end of the day, they were buying distros, and they were buying our services to go build out a cloud. So that brings up a question, and I think, yes, you talked about this earlier. How many people, how many customers, when they come to you, um, have that sort of total cost of ownership mind frame? How many people, like, think about what is it that I'm trying to do here, and is cost one of the main reasons? And if so, how do I go about measuring costs? Is, is it just the direct capex costs, or you know, people costs, that kind of? So okay. you know. So so, most of the customers who come to us are essentially customers who have tried do-it-yourself model. They tried do-it-yourself model. Six months down the line, they have still still trying it and things like that, and they have kind of failed as such. And yes, at that point in time, they have said, okay, let's try to explore other opportunities. We have had customers, again, uh, a big software conglomerate in uh, India. We have had a, a big retail giant in the US. They have deployed uh, uh, our appliance in their environment, and yes, it has started working within a week or so. Yeah? So I think we have had, and again, I do understand what Kam where Kamesh is coming from and where, why he would say that, yes, uh, uh, there are some customized uh, challenges that uh, we will face when it comes to appliance. But yes, we are, ta we are targeting a specific, a specific uh, profile of customers wherein uh, we are able to get into the customer and see, come up with a pre-packaged, pre-validated stuff. So I and, think... An appliance, I think, is really, again, it's trying to address that, that issue of operations. So somebody else has, has yeah. gives you a rigid architecture. Don't deviate from that architecture if you can help it. And the tools and other pieces packaged to do operations. But 
I think that's one way of addressing it. Another way, um, you know, OpenStack open source is very good at collaborating between developers or, or facilitating collaboration between developers to create code. But the thing that it's only now really starting to recognize, and, and certainly it's a flag that we're bearing right now, is, is collaborating on operations, right? So everybody has their own puppet scripts or their own chef scripts yep. or whatever it is, but there is best practice on how to back up an OpenStack environment, how to upgrade an OpenStack environment, how to pause, resume, et cetera. And uh, a lot of the stuff that we're doing with Juju and the charms that we have is, is how do we codify that such mm -hmm. that everybody in this room can, can input into that to be able to share that, that common best practice because in doing so, we're sharing the cost of operations across the entire audience. So, That's a very key point, actually. I, I think that is where the challenge is with any OpenStack cloud you may be building. Ultimately, it's all about orchestration at a higher level across multiple clouds, across multiple availability zones, across mm -hmm. data centers. And once we solve that problem, you don't have to have a specific tool, but it's really all about what are the best practices for ops. And as a community, if we come together and solve that problem, I don't know if there are committees or something, but eventually we need something that'll kind of build those Many templates, committees. if you yeah. will, right? And then you can use different tools. You can use Puppet, you can use Juju or whatever, but then you can implement them and run ops because I think that's a key challenge still. And, and OpenStack gets compared with Linux. So in this uh, sort of uh, sentiment, how can um, the OpenStack community learn from some of the, the, uh, the, the stuff that has happened in the Linux community so or even I, Apache and other places? So I don't buy the argument that OpenStack is Linux. Linux uh, is to compared one. Compared to. I, yeah, but if you think about it, right, Linux is a single server. Mm -hmm. You need an admin for that server. You can deploy it and you're done. I mean, we, here we're talking about large-scale clouds. And it's a very different ball game and, and a very different beast you're dealing with, right? So it's orchestration, it's ops. Of course, it's all running on Linux boxes at the end of the day, but it's, you have to look, it's, take one step there, higher. There's, there's certainly yeah. comparison points. Yeah. So yeah. Linux is a collection of very many different packages or technologies that have to be integrated, tested together. They have to be supportable uh, for customers that require that. Uh, they have to be robust and resilient. And there are certainly things that the OpenStack community can learn, continues to learn from, from that environment. Uh, obviously, a lot of us are, are involved deeply in Linux anyway. So. Uh, in terms of being able to create a consumable platform uh, uh, for, for people. But absolutely right, it's, yeah. there are, there, it's additional layers of complexity. Yeah, people have called uh, OpenStack as the operating system of the data center, right? Um, aptly so, because that's what it's meant to be, right? Mm -hmm. You can kind of use it as an operating system, but it's, it's long time, long ways away from there. We've come a long way in the last six months, uh, last six years, but I think we have a longer way to go on the ops side. So, um, any questions from the audience? Anyone? Um, so we have around 10 minutes left, and I'd like to switch gears and talk about workloads. And you know, at this summit, we have a lot of focus on NFV. Last time, it was uh, all about IoT. Um, so I'd like to sort of, you know, pose the question on, you know, what type of workloads do you typically see your customers deploy, and why? Um, and and um, you know, we have this discussion around traditional workloads, cloud-enabled workloads, and then cloud-native workloads. And you know, people call them on any given day different names, but you get the idea. So I just wanted to sort of um, you know, ask uh, you, um, and, and yes, maybe we can start with you. You had a startup, you had a bunch of apps that were written mm -hmm. cloud-native, if yep, you will. Uh, yeah. How do you see OpenStack helping or not helping and, and the model, the consumption model with okay. these apps? So I think, uh, the way we have positioned ourselves is, okay, this is an infrastructure for your cloud native apps. For whenever it is cloud native apps, uh, we kind of are going ahead with OpenStack. Not only that, we also have, we are providing this infrastructure as a service to all the uh, uh, app developers and things like that. In addition to that, uh, the Pivotal Cloud Foundry, the PaaS platform is for the past platform also, this Neutrino VX Slack, sorry, I'm not supposed to be doing a product this year, but mm -hmm. our product can act as a infrastructure as a service for the, the past layer also. So essentially the cloud native apps, that is the main, uh, that is the uh, biggest workload that we see, uh, that is the biggest uh, focus area for us. And then what about use cases? Any particular, um, you know, you know, industry specific apps or? No, see the thing is we are, again, uh, we are at a very initial phase of the whole thing and we are still in the uh, stage of trying to find out the, the right marketplace, the, the, the right uh, profile of a customer and things like that. 
So we launched our product only two, uh, two months back, so we are in the whole process. Yes, we have lots of deployments all over the place, uh, but we are into that whole process at this point in time. So I, I'd say um, successful clouds, certainly in the enterprise or organizational space, and we'll put NFP to one side for a second, um, successful clouds will trend to generality, so it'll be a general purpose cloud that will consume most, if not all, workloads. Right, so we see the signs of successful clouds are that they continue to grow and they get more and more workloads. And they can be very diverse, web workloads, databases, analytics, whatever. Um, NFV is a, is, a, is, a, is a slightly different, we have many uh, NFV customers. Um, it's a slightly different use case because they have VNFs, which is fancy telco speak for an app. And, um, but they're very network centric applications and performance and throughput are very important. We still think there's a very strong argument for having uh, a common layer as the, as the underpinning without sort of tuning, uh, really fine tuning it per VNF because then you're, you're creating these hot spots of, of, of complexity. Um, but they are, it's, they're, they're different in their makeup to their sort of general purpose organizational enterprise clouds. I tend to agree with that. I think, I think although OpenStack originally started off as a cloud native platform, mm -hmm. um, there's an interesting story I can share with you. I have a I, I live in Silicon Valley, and I have a lot of friends who start companies. So there's a guy, an old friend of mine, who, who worked at Microsoft Azure, and he's a you know, serial entrepreneur. So after he sold his company to Microsoft, he came back and he started a new company. And I happened to meet him over coffee a couple of weeks ago and asked, hey, what are you up to now? And he said, hey, I'm building this cloud for legacy workloads. I said, what do you mean? Oh, yeah, I'm, you know, all these PeopleSoft and SAP and databases, SQL, I said, really? I mean, that's not what the cloud is for. But he said that 80% of the customers he was talking to when he was back at Microsoft wanted to put those workloads on the cloud. But Azure, these guys at Azure said, no, 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 that's not, that's not the right place. You know, we, we're not going to. So no SLAs for that kind of stuff. So he started this company. So I think OpenStack, you know, just by virtue of all the work that's going on, is perfect for that mixed general workload type of environment. You can run cloud native apps, you can run container apps, you can run legacy apps if you want to. Of course, you know, you've got to look at the reliability of the infrastructure, et cetera. But I think it's the way OpenStack, the way it has evolved over the last several years, is it's, it's perfect for a general purpose you know, workload. One, one of the scenario. challenges, yeah. I mean, yeah. you say many legacy apps will yeah. run just fine in an OpenStack environment. Yeah. Um, there we see challenges. There are some technology challenges depending on the app, but actually there's a great deal of licensing or commercial challenges, That's true. right? Yeah. Uh, which is what puts people off. Moving a database, I won't name a database vendor, but moving a database vendor from a single on, on bare metal machine to into a cloud can, can suddenly get very expensive. Uh, so uh, those, those are considerations that, that people have to live with. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, okay. Um, any questions? Coming up on the five minutes, final five minutes, any questions? Um, Oh, sure, yeah. What would you say is the... What, what mic coming up, mic coming up. Hello? Yeah. Uh, what is the toughest challenge? Why, uh, why is it so difficult to operate a do-it-yourself cluster compared to your solutions? So a certain amount of that comes from uh, the community is developing capabilities and features. And a lot of that focus and development has been around how, um, how can we make an OpenStack environment compare well to um, an Amazon or an Azure or a Google, right? We want to be able to, or even a, a VMware type of environment. How can we uh, provide those kind of capabilities? It's very feature driven. Um, you don't really work out what the operational challenges are until people really start operating it themselves for real, right? And that's when. Um, you start to like, okay, how do, how do I really manage backups? If I need to be able to perform maintenance on a node, how do I really evacuate all of those things in a clean way and do it in an automated way? And so um, it's, a, it's a learning journey, right? If you have a vendor, a vendor's, you know, we have product managers and product people that will try and look down this and, and, and figure it out. OpenStack, whilst it has a product working group, doesn't have product managers that are saying, are identifying um, you know, these pockets. Yes, there are companies, all three of the companies up here contributing to OpenStack and working on that, but there's no sort of single person responsible for setting that agenda. So. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the, I mean, you have to look at the whole open source movement as such, you know? I mean, this is somebody, this is something I was told by a person who is a leader in the open source. He says that, 
people get into open source, they are very enthusiastic about it and they jump into it and they start developing the software and things like that. They get a, they get a high of kind of coming up with the software. And yes, they take the software up to 90% of where it has to be. Yeah? And that is where they get a tremendous amount of satisfaction. The last mile or the last 10% is where uh, they move on to something else. And then it is left for the, and again, when you as consumers of that open source project, when you take that, you are dealt with that remaining 10%, the challenges of that last 10% which was not done by the software developers per se. Yeah? And this is where the, when the you know, rubber hits the road, that's, that is where you kind of have the challenges. So that's what he said, you know, the operational challenges. Because yes, that thing has not been tested for each and every use case. That thing has not been tested for each and every configuration that you might be having and things like that. So that is where I would say that, uh, and that's why we have you know, Red Hat as a successful company over there, though the open source is there for a long time. And I feel that that is one big aspect of it. And then, yes, all the things like, uh, and if you look at uh, what, the, the, what the distros provide is the engineering support, the, the packaging, the bug fixing, the testing, and all those kind of things. That's they how do our, those different, kind of, that's our yeah. differentiation, that, actually, that's, how that's, we differentiate between each other is that, they have a great way of doing things, we have a great way of doing things, you have a great way of doing right. things. You as a, an end user. So will, I'll, give, we'll a, I'll give an example. Um, so one of our largest telco customers started off with doing their own stuff, right, using trunk. Uh, at one point, they had 300 plus developers that were doing, you know, they took code from the trunk and they deployed it and they ran it. They had all these Frankenstein clouds all over the place. What they found out after about a year was 200 of those developers were fixing bugs in OpenStack trunk, right? They were fixing bugs that wasn't adding business value to their applications. So they said, why are we doing this? Why are 200 of our developers fixing things that these distro guys are going to fix anyway? because that's their job. Let's focus on what's, val what's value add for us and put those developers to better use. So they ended up using a distribution and they freed up all those guys. And the distribution company, of course, is responsible for fixing the bugs and making sure it's supported. So that was their logic, right? Uh, you know, from a financial standpoint, from a value add standpoint, they moved from DIY to distribution. Uh, yeah, this is not a new model. Yeah. People in the 70s, big companies in the 70s used to write their own databases, and then they found there was a better way of consuming database technology. Likewise with Linux, it's the same with, same so, with OpenStack. Yeah. Um, we have one question here. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm working for uh, one of the biggest uh, hosting companies in the world. Uh, one of the things we're looking at right now, and we kind of um, foresee it in the future is that a big competition to OpenStack, not today, but maybe one, two, three years down the road, would be uh, Kubernetes. I know today there's a lot of talk in this summit that uh, you know you can run uh, uh, Kubernetes uh, within OpenStack, but we kind of see Kubernetes coming in from behind and offering somewhat similar services or uh, uh, alternative of running workloads. Uh, I was curious how you see that. So you have to. Uh, I mean, it's like VMs versus containers. At the end of the day, your VMs are not disappearing. Your existing workloads all run on VMs. So you have the whole effort of moving those VMs and contain microservices, creating microservices out of them, and then running it on containers. So, so there's, a, there's a migration effort involved co and cost involved. Just like you would move bare metal workloads to VMs, it's the same sort of effort. So there's a lot of existing workloads that will continue to run on VMs. There are, I think yeah. it's also important to say Kubernetes is very focused around process containers or Docker containers, right? So if you're going to you know, create 12 factor apps and re architect into microservices and all of those things that the cool kids do, um, great, that's going to be an option for you. But uh, a great many applications are not ready to be yeah. 12 factor and microservices. You may want to take a VM and stick it in a general purpose machine container, like a LXD container, yeah. and that, that's going to be a, a lot less heavy lifting. But whilst Lots of cool kids talk about these microservices. You know, the reality is it's still a little way off. And Kubernetes is, is kind of sort of like OpenStack five years ago, right? I mean, they, they just started, the foundation was started like six months back. Yeah, they, they've got some. So give them some time. I mean, it's not like it's ready for production, prime time, large scale clouds yet. I mean, that's the reality of it. So we, have, uh, we are almost out of time. A couple of things I, before I hand over to the last question. I, I believe uh, Dell EMC is doing a raffle, and so yes. after this, um, feel free to pick up a 
raffle thing and win an appliance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You get a free appliance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <they're>, Actually, we <laughs> do uh, have we do uh, have Bluetooth an app appliance. <laughs> yes. <laughs> By the way, we do have a, a OpenStack appliance on the sh on the sh uh, floor of the yeah? and please uh, have a look at it. It's a, it's a running appliance that is going on over there. So, okay. uh, question. Actually, I was uh, just uh, disagree with you, Kamesh, a little bit uh, when it comes to uh, going on yourself, going vanilla, totally vanilla. It won't mean that you're going to be in the wild uh, by yourself. Mm -hmm. You have the community. Sure. So yeah. the fixes come. Mm -hmm. What you going to what, what you ain't going to have is somebody took over your 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 Behind. ass basically. Yeah. Meaning you're going to have to be very. Uh, 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 aware of the challenges and, and tough to, to fix stuff by yourself if they are needed. Otherwise, the community will be there, that's for sure. The, the, question, the question you're asking, I think, is kind of one of the key questions in OpenStack right now is, 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 is OpenStack a product or is it a group of projects that are turned into products by people like us? And so um, it's, uh, it's kind of, that's still yet to really play out, I think. So it's not just the code. Right. Again, I'll, I'll go back to ops. I'll go back to configurations. I mean, you have to still do all that stuff, right? I mean, you know, most distro companies, like we, these guys have Juju, we have Fuel. Mm -hmm. So they, they, we make it easy for you to kind of get it all up and running. Right? So that, that's a value add as well. Okay. All right.